you learn some things from each other. Uh, it is very frustrating, some of these summer schools, because there is so much experience in this room. And it's, it's frustrating that we can't bottle it and share it around easily. Um, <clears throat> but of course, I do encourage you in the evenings and lunches and so on to go up to people and say, I, haven't, I want to know more about what's going on in your country or whatever it might be. So please don't be shy with one another. Mind you, I don't see much shyness, I have to say. Everybody seems to be very active. OK. Uh, this session um, is all about organizing informal and precarious workers, uh, which we've already been touching on several times about mean, how do informal and precarious workers organize. Um, we're going to try and do this in a new way, right? which is rather than ask each of our panelists um, to make presentations and then have responses, we simply want your questions about organizing informal and precarious workers, and we'll put those to all or some or one or two of the panelists. Okay, There's a way of them talking about what they do and what they feel. And I'm going to sort of act as a sort of active chair, right? <laughs> as it were. So, I would like to, oh, first of all, of course, introduce everybody. Um, we have Jin Suk Lee from BWI. I think everybody knows Jin Suk now. Yeah. And what's your actual job title, Jin Suk? Uh, the actual official title is Migration, Gender, and Campaign Director. Migration. Gender. Gender and campaign director. Okay, and Joanna uh, from the Bulgarian Home-Based Workers Association. Do you want to just say what you do in the association? We are trying to organize. Well, your job. Your job. I still not have a job. <laughs> <laughs> but you're involved in the association. Yeah. yeah. I'm kind of student. I still a student. Okay. Yeah. And Kendall, say what you do. Uh, I'm the director of the fast food campaign that, uh, well, it's been in the US, but then it actually went global on May 15th. And uh, how many people have heard about this amazing campaign in the United States for fast food workers? Great. And I'm really glad that we managed to get Kendall to come because I think people will find it very interesting to learn from your experience. OK, I'm going to cut, cut, start things off, and then it will be open for questions from you. So I'd like to ask each of you, first of all, what organizing strategies do you think have been most effective in really working in the sectors that you're in? Maybe start with Jin Sook. <laughs> um, well, let me focus uh, on the Because I know when we're talking about informal and precarious workers, uh, maybe it's most, uh, one area that we do not as focus so much as in terms of tribal workers. And so that's, I like to focus on that. But for us, what we work in terms of organizing my campus is developing a global campaign. Right. Uh, clearly, well, you know, it, it's traditional in terms of construction. Workers move from one place to another world. But in terms of with globalization, it's become much more so. So for BWI, we recognize there's been an increasing need to develop a global strategy around uh, specifically of migrants. And, and the, that strategy, of course, we look at it in two ways. One, we have unions like UNIA, who doesn't really need the support of BWI. They, they recognize it's important. They've done it very well. 52% of their membership are in construction are migrant workers. But there are other unions that are really struggling. So in that level, we could develop a global campaign, which is basically a framework. And that framework is then initiated and developed and implemented by our affiliates. Because we are a global union, so we don't do the direct work. It's our affiliates who have to organize. And so our angle to there is to develop a strategy at a global level that will also help them give them the tools necessary to be implemented in a national and level site. And if you, I mean, in terms of construction workers, for example, you have both unions in the places where people come from and the unions that the places are going to. Do you organize both, or how do you relate those two? I'm looking at the audience because I'm also seeing, trying to look at sachets here. 
or if you could have jet lag and so be. But um, Sashi, if you have a chance, it would be really great to be able to talk to Sashi. Because Sashi represents a unit that organizes workers in the country of origin, which is India itself, and then they have members in the Gulf. Because in the Gulf, the majority of the workers in the construction are migrant workers, mainly from South Asia. In Qatar, it's 99%. In Oman, it's about 80%. In Bahrain, it's about 60 so the strategy that our, our affiliates do is that they organize before they leave. And then when they're in the country of destination, and we were talking about in, in the Gulf where there's no legal framework to join trade unions, except in, the, in, in Qatar they can't join trade unions. So the, the work that the PMLU does is actually do direct servicing or so providing support for workers who are their members, and not just them, who are not their members, but if they need in distress in in the uh, country of destination. And then this, and Sasha is here. And Sasha actually, yeah, there he is. <laughs> Sasha, he's with the Serbian Union. Um, and part of what his union has done is actually organize not only the Serbian workers before they went to Moscow and built the Olympics in Sochi, but they actually have also provided support for the workers who were stuck in Sochi. And in which when they come back to Serbia, then they try to recruit them. Remind people what Sochi is. The Winter Olympics, you know, where Korea came, I think, fifth or sixth in the Olympics. <laughs> 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 Joanna, do you want to talk a little bit about how how, how you've managed to organize home-based workers in Bulgaria? Well, we believe that the first step to organize them is to map them and to register them because Home-based workers are mainly informal worker, workers, and they are invisible for the economy, for the government, and so on. And that's why we, the first step we have taken is to map them, and after that we are trying to help them uh, where the selling their production because the majority of them are producing something and to help the others which are uh, employers which are employee of someone uh, to fight for their rights and to uh, receive what they have to and that's mainly what we are doing. Okay, so, I, I have to confess that I've, I know this association quite well. <laughs> um, and what, what is interesting is that there are two different sorts of home-based workers in Bulgaria. There are those which we might call outsourced workers. So if you, for example, buy a pair of handmade, quote-unquote, Italian shoes, right, that will probably have been stitched together uh, by an outsourced worker in Bulgaria right, who will do the actual stitching of the shoe. And there are many, many thousands of uh, outsourced workers in Bulgaria, many of whom originally used to work in factories, but then the factories closed down and moved out, and then they were forced to take work as home-based workers. But there's other form of home-based work, which is what we often call own account workers, like self-employed workers, who make things at home to, for them to sell, either in the streets or in a shop or in the market or whatever. And it could be carvings or paintings or food or many other things. And so the association that also has shops, for example, in a lot of towns where they sell for those workers to the public. Um, Obviously, we're going to hear more from Joanna, but just in case I forget to say, on the front here is a couple of booklets which you're free to take, which talk about more about home-based workers organizing, but we'll hear more. Um, okay. Uh, or fast food workers in the States. Um, uh, well, I'm not that familiar with, uh, like, all the uh, kind of the people in the room and what is where? How many people have fast food, like Taco Bell, McDonald's, like where you're from? Can you, if you have Taco Bell, McDonald's, Wendy's, Burke fast food? Oh, okay. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> well, I, I would say that, well, that's, I would say that's probably the first thing that we did different. 
uh, I started off in like hospital and uh, nursing home organizing. And so, you know, if you're organizing a 140 person nursing home in Cleveland, it's hard to resonate with people. They, they, don't, they don't understand. Uh, but uh, when you start striking workers from McDonald's and Wendy's, it's really easy to explain what you're doing. And so I think that that was the first thing that we did different is uh, we picked iconic workplace workplaces that were really easy to understand. Like everybody knows someone that works in fast food. People understand that they were going on strike and people understood that the workers were asking for $15 in a union contract, uh, which I felt like was dramatically different than anything else we did. Uh, the second thing that I think that we did differently is uh, we in May we struck 150 cities across the U.S., but if you look at each city, uh, it's different. It's not cookie cutter. They're built, uh, they're coalitions. So if you look in each city, it's pretty much comprised of various labor unions, various community organizations, various uh, churches, various community leaders, uh, various politicians, uh, on a city level, state level, and sometimes federal level. And so it's like these coalitions that have been built. Uh, it becomes useful when, um, for instance, you know, you have five workers from a 50-person Wendy's that went on strike, and then when they walk back into work the next day, the employer tries to fire them. So it's easy to then uh, react with 200 people inside of their store to shut their store down uh, because they have – it's because of the coalition that's built and people are already informed and they're a part of the campaign every single step of the way. So it's not like you're just calling someone up trying to explain a campaign about what happened. They know what happens because we have coalition meetings in all the cities often. The strikes are like literally all, when we go on strike, it's all over the national news, all over the local news, it's all over the radio, uh, which I think inspires people to want to get involved. Uh, so I think the actual coalitions that we've built uh, in each city has been dramatically different and helpful in organizing. So the iconic workplaces, the actual coalitions. And then I would say the third thing that has been really helpful in this campaign is social media. So the, the first strike happened in New York on November uh, 29th, 2012. And, you know, by the a year later, by the end of 2013, we were in 100 cities across the U.S., uh, taking workers on strike, and you know, really, the way that we were we were being contacted was through social media. So we had workers that were reaching out to us through Twitter, through Facebook, uh, through our website, so on and so forth. And you know, I've worked other campaigns where we've tried to figure out the social media piece, but it's really complicated. But uh, I think you know, with the iconic workplaces, kind of the momentum behind the campaign that is it's fueled uh, the new media or the online. Uh, presence in a way that isn't isn't really convenient on other campaigns. So I would say those are the three things that that we've done dramatically different. In in the UK, um, uh, I remember quite recently I was asking uh, the um, uh, national officer union organizer for the food sector in my own union in Unite, and I said, why aren't we organizing McDonald's workers, for example? And he said, the problem with that is that they are very transient. Yeah, so you get students, you get uh, temporarily unemployed people, you get young people who may only work there for a couple of months and they move on. And it has a very far, high turnover. And he said, how can we possibly organize them? Because we go in and organize and uh, then maybe you're successful, but then three months later we're going to have to go right back and start all over again. How did you overcome that problem? Or is it a problem? Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> You know, uh, the workers the workers in the U.S. are now in the process of fighting for the union, so they've been doing one-day strikes. So, you know, you'll they'll pull off a one-day strike, but when they go back into work, they still don't have the union. So they're still in the process of fighting for the union. Uh, I would – the workforce is transient. The workforce has changed dramatically in the U.S. So, you know, five or seven years ago, these were teenage kids that were trying to get book bags and some new tennis shoes, a little pocket cash. Now the average fast food worker is over 21 years old. Two thirds of them are women. Most of them have children. The fast food industry in the U.S. is the fastest growing industry in the U.S. It's also the lowest paying industry in the U.S. So these are becoming career jobs. So when you meet a lot of these workers, they're five year, eight year, you know, fast food workers. They may have jumped around from store to store, but uh, you know, they have been in fast food. So I think. Um, the, the fact that the workforce has changed, so they're not as transient as they used to be. I think that, you know, the campaign uh, is resigna uh, resonating on a, like a national level and a local level. 
So if you go to Detroit, for instance, and you, you just ask a random person walking down the street, have you heard for the fight for 15? They're going to say, yep, I heard of it. So what that means is a lot of the fast food workers who are then coming into the stores, they've already heard about the campaign. So they're already familiar with the fact that fast food workers are in the process of organizing and they're more likely to get involved uh, because the campaign is so big and it's so visible. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's been helpful. But we still are training leaders inside of every shop the same way that we always have. Uh, so we'll train two leaders per shop. So we try to have each shop have two workers that are trained up to actually organize their store. But if one of them leaves or two of them leave, then we just find you know the next two people and do the same thing. But once again, Generally speaking, people know about the campaign, so it's not like they're organizing their coworkers and they don't know that their coworkers don't know that it's happening. Their coworkers are very aware that fast food workers are fighting for fifteen dollars, which is a little bit different than you know being in a nursing home, for instance, where the other you know ten people are for the union and the other hundred and thirty people don't even know that a drive is actually happening. So it's it's been helpful in that sense. Great. Uh, by the way, it's very remiss of me not to mention that we had very much hoped that Myrtle Vitboy, who is the head of the chair, is that right, or the, of the president of the International Domestic Workers Federation, was going to be with us this week. Unfortunately, she, she was not able to get a visa in time. But I hope, if you're there, Myrtle, <laughs> she's online watching in a moment. And when we finish our discussion here, we're going to invite, hopefully, Myrtle to come online and, and respond to some of the questions and the discussions we've got. So she's sitting there, hopefully, hello Myrtle, in uh, South Africa, in Durban, Cape Town, where is she? Cape Town. Cape Town. And uh, she'll be participating uh, on Skype uh, in a moment, I hope. Okay, questions from you all. Who would like to ask a question? Sujata. I, um, uh, in, in, in the Indian context, what has happened is that whenever there's been, there's been a lot of organizing of the informal economy workers, um, who are, uh, the, and various uh, experiences, uh, two experiences which I would like to just very briefly say and then uh, ask, uh, ask a question. Uh, one is where, where there are small uh, factory workers, very, very five and six. Uh, the moment there's a union organizing, they, they, they lose their jobs. And then the union has to uh, you know, go into, the, in, into courts and so on and so forth, which is a very, very expensive process, which their membership does not, their mem mem membership dues does not match with. Uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a uh, unsustainability built into that. Similarly with uh, agricultural workers. Uh, so there's been a lot of agricultural workers unionizing, but they, because of the unsustainability, um, uh, what the, what uh, unions have done is formed NGOs, which you know we, we get funding in some way or the other. Um, so I just wanted to see uh, whether you could uh, see if you can say uh, 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 your reflections and your experiences about how sustainable mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to uh, sustain uh, uh, informal sector organizing on its own or uh, 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 is it li likely that it's going to be dependent on outside funding or on outside support in some way or the other uh, for some time to come? Thank you. So in brief that means if you've got very poor workers or very transient workers, can you build a union where they are paying sufficient union dues that actually maintain the organization or are they actually dependent on external funding to, to keep themselves going. So that's the first question. Let's just take a couple more. Sam? Uh, well, I have a few questions, so I'll, I'll try to be very short. Uh, just on this last question of... Uh, Stand up, please, Sam. Sorry. On the question of sustainability, uh, I'd like to know whether there's an internal union problem, because this is a long-term project, and even if you're being relatively successful, you're not getting agreements. So is there any internal divisions about why are we concentrating on this when there's other things to do? I just like to know that. I'd like to know whether your strategy is regional. Like, are you trying to get contracts in a particular city? You know, at what point do you try to do that? Uh, I don't know if you want to answer this on camera, but I'm interested in the people insulting, which is sending people in explicitly. You may not want to answer that. And I, I, I'd very much like to know, I mean, one of the unique things that you said was that there's a lot of cooperation across the union. And that's actually been very rare anywhere in North America before the unions actually help each other organize. But 
just to be clear, as I understand it, it's SEIU that is leading this, and other unions are agreeing to join it. Okay, let's just take uh, one or two more. I'm trying to find somebody who hasn't asked me any questions before. Yes. Sorry, I can't remember your name. Yes, I'm a test from Cambodia. Oh, yes. So, uh, my question is pretty easy. Uh, since we're talking about global unions, so I have two questions. First, uh, how the global strategy of organizing pain came out? Because we have some uh, mis understanding of how do we follow the global union because my question is do the global union organizing their member or their member organizing the global union to do the work <laughs> because uh, sometimes of course there's some compromising question along the way but uh, just to educate me I a little bit uh, didn't follow <laughs> Okay, I, I'll, I've, I know there's other questions to come, but let's just take those first. Uh, can we just deal first with the question of sustainability? And maybe each of you respond to that question. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to um, take from what I got from the previous uh, discussion when we were talking about organizing. I think it's important for us as, as PWI when we look at our global campaign around migrant workers, we're not looking at our success in terms of numbers of migrant workers for nutrition. Uh, if we were to look at that, it will take us a hundred years. Because as, as hard as it is to organize <laughs> workers in general, it's hard to organize migrant workers who are in temporary contract in the phone for two or three years, and all they're thinking about is making enough money to go back home. So the idea of them joining the union, and so that they pay membership dues to sustain our our, our global organization is not something we look at. What we look at in terms of our campaign is to improve the working and living conditions of my So in terms of the global spectrum, obviously in, in the north, migrant workers who have joined trade unions who have, um, the situation is far better in some way. But there are cases I know in, 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 uh, in Switzerland where there have been a number of Polish workers who I would say is the same case as maybe close to Qatar. But Qatar is, is, is horrific. Right? So our campaign around migrant workers is to really look at improving their conditions, that they at least have basic rights, and that they have uh, not even just been looking at the right to join trade unions, but the right to the fact that they will be able to be only working for, for Eight hours, eight hours a day. That they don't, they're not stuck in a living place like this with a hundred workers to respect. So I think that's how I would answer in terms of when we're looking at the organizing in terms of our strategy. And my at the same time, it's the same we would say in terms of the informal sector, as you're saying in India. I mean, to think that you can organize a large number of informal workers that was sustained financially by organization would be also difficult. But what we're working is that we would improve their living conditions. I think that's the, the, the way we look at in terms of what's in the strategy. And I'll answer your question. <coughs> Joanna, how does, how does the association, is it sustainable from the fees paid by the members, or does it depend on <laughs> external funding? Well, for sure, uh, we are dependable from external uh, funding. Because the fee that the members pay is uh, not enough, uh, having in mind the projects that we are trying to uh, do, and mainly we uh, depend on, uh, not depend, but we are uh, look at the funding from EU or from the government. And I think that that's all I can say. Sorry, I'm new. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, um, right now, the uh, the fast food workers don't pay dues, obviously, to, uh, to any union. <clears throat> uh, the unions that are participating in the campaign, uh, you know, SEIU specifically, our members voted to uh, contribute their money to make sure that these workers get inside of the union and <clears throat> you know they did that because 
you know, there's about 4 million uh, fast food workers across the U.S., about 40 million low-wage workers. You have uh, the private sector unionization is down to 6.6, 6.5%. So, you know, in a lot of ways, this was an aspirational campaign from the beginning. You know, the $15 demand, the one-day strikes, the fast, you know, a lot of things were just really aspirational. Uh, you know, we haven't really gotten into the dirty details of what the due structure is going to be. We don't even know what union these uh, workers are going to go inside of. Like, are they going to go inside of an independent union? <clears throat> Will it be national? Will it be local? Will it be internet? We just don't know the answers. And uh, what we just keep telling ourselves now is first we have to uh, build our power and make sure that when we get to the ne negotiating table with the employer, which will I assume be a national or international uh, table because the campaign is now international, then I think that it's just going to depend on how much power we have when we get to the table and we'll be able to hammer out uh, hammer out like the dirty details of how the money gets dispensed. Uh, you know, our members, uh, members of SEIU are dedicated to seeing this campaign all the way through and making sure that fast food workers win because they believe that if 4 million fast food workers end up in a union, that that's going to dramatically change the power structure nationally for uh, all union members, and that's ultimately why SEIU members decided to like contribute their money. So hopefully that answers your question. Jin Suk, I think the question from our comrade from Cambodia was directed to you, really. If I could look at, um, if I can specifically talk about our migration campaign, it was not a campaign that came up. It came as a result of, uh, in, in our second World Congress, we had about, I think, 11 resolutions on migration. It came from the affiliates. The affiliates recognized that we have to address the influx of migrant workers in this in our sector. We have to figure out how to organize them. We have to figure out how to reintegrate them into trading structures or build a, 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 a dip, uh, to improve the situation. And so as a result of the 11 resolutions, we actually incorporated the strategic plan. And that led to the framing of a global campaign that was built on the experience of the affiliates. So it is, again, so the, not a global union coming down and saying, OK, that's all the unions. You organize my workers. It came from the affiliates who said, we need to address this. In the same way that we're dealing with now, like the Chinese multinational companies, it's coming from our affiliates where they see an influx of Chinese companies, and they're pushing us to address it. So this, then this campaign that we've developed, and it would, that we developed, we took the experiences of the different affiliates, what works and what doesn't work, and it's, it's a tool. So the, if, then we work with the affiliates to develop the, the, from the frame that would work for them depending on the, the cultural context, depending on the national context, and the capacity of the union. That's what really, uh, and then not only the capacity, the commitment of the union. Because no matter how much we can say to the Malaysian union, you need to organize migrant workers because 70% are migrant. If they don't want to do it, it's not going to work. Does that help? We can have a drink later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and there's questions on a how do unions how do the unions prioritize how and why do the unions prioritize uh, fast food workers? And secondly, about the cooperation between the unions that you've, you've mentioned, how was that built? I mean, both of those questions directed to you. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know. I think I mean the the real reason that uh, the fast food campaign has become the priority of. Uh, you know, SEIU is because what I already said, you know, uh, private sector unionization is down to 6.6 .6 and decline. Like, there's no, like, people are trying to figure out how to turn the trend back up. And so this was uh, somewhat of an aspirational campaign uh, to try to turn the trend up, I guess, by, you know, the 4 million. You have to, so, uh, let me put some context on it. So if you look at one of our cities where we're striking fast food workers, what you'll find is, uh, as we started getting towards the like third and fourth strike in a lot of these cities, we had CBS workers like, uh, you know, people who work cash registers at certain places trying to figure out could they go on strike with these workers, people who work in the gym, you know, at like Gold's Gym, can we go on strike? Any low wage worker basically in the city was trying to figure out how can I be a part of this campaign because it's so high profile, it's on every radio station, it's all over the news. So, you know, you have to wonder when the four million fast food workers end up in the in the union, does that create a catalytic moment where it sparks, you know, other low wage workers to say, hey, if if that if invisible fast food workers 
can go from seven twenty five to fifteen dollars, then what about me at Jiffy Lube? What about me at you know as a cash register person at CBS or you know all of these other low wage workers? So that's that's why it's been prioritized uh, because we're trying to figure out how to you know start an incline on the actual statistics uh, and you know stop the stop the bleeding. And then uh, SEIU, what was the question? Well, uh, around the, unions. Well, the, the I think the in the United States, the unions are notorious for not being able to cooperate with one another. Yet you built <laughs> clearly cooperation. How was that done? Yeah, I mean it's the same. I mean, look, I'll be frank. Uh, when the when the campaign first started, people thought thought we were crazy. They thought the workers in New York that were talking about going on strike were crazy because people were like, a, they're never going to get fifteen dollars. B, if these fast food workers who nobody cares about. Uh, goes on strike, they're going to all be fired, and it's going to be blood all in the street, and this campaign makes no sense. And that's what unions were saying. That's what anybody who knew about the campaign was saying. Uh, after the first strike happened, when the first strike happened in New York, literally every media out, every national media outlet from the U.S. was there to talk to these workers and figure out why they were striking and what their living conditions were like and what their working conditions were like. So it ended up on every news station in the country. So my mother, I'm in New York where the strike happened. My mother stays in Kansas City, Missouri, and she called me and said, hey, I see the fast food workers on TV right now. So, I mean, it ended up just being this really, really big thing. And I think that, uh, you know, the labor movement as a whole is trying to figure out how, how to survive and kind of how to stop the bleeding and start, uh, start bringing more workers into the union. And, you know, this is the best opportunity that we have. So I think the labor movement has, has decided that they're going to galvanize their power around these fast food workers and see if we can bring it home. And then, you know, I, and as you look at each city, you can see other low wage workers are starting to chomp at the bits, trying to figure out how they can get involved in the campaign. So people can kind of see in their own particular sectors, but also in other sectors that there will be a lot of opportunity. And uh, people are, low wage workers are becoming inspired and motivated by what's happening with these workers. So they're starting to feel like maybe I can do it. So I think that that's a big reason that other unions have gotten involved because they see the opportunity uh, that the that the campaign presents, you know, kind of on the back end, and you know, and the present opportunity just with you know actually supporting these workers. Great. Okay. Let's have some more questions. Who's not uh, answered? You, I don't think you've asked a question yet. Yeah, please <laughs> yeah. go on. Yeah. Stand up. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, Yvonne from Switzerland from a solidarity organization called Solid Funds. Uh, um, it's a question to Joanna, a, concern, a very practical question concerning the um, the work with uh, the home-based uh, workers. Yeah. I assume it's mainly women workers. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Uh, and it's, um, I mean, home-based work is the most extreme form of um, outsourcing work. Um, it's invisible workers uh, who often don't know who they work for, who, who their employer is. Uh, they're totally isolated. So I think it's really difficult actually to get them organized. So I'd like to know how um, what, how did you do to actually organize 40,000 uh, home-based <laughs> workers? And also, did the initiative come from uh, the workers themselves, or was it from a, a trade union outside um, or a labor rights organization? Yeah. Well, it's uh, both sides process. And it's both from the workers <coughs> themselves and from the association. Uh, the first way, the first part of the question was how they are organized. Well, for sure, it's not. Sorry, uh, what you do to approach them because they're so isolated. Well, uh, mainly uh, from word from mouth to mouth. Because uh, they are, they are, they want something to be done for them, and uh, joining one, uh, one worker, or and spreading the news, the news around others, because the towns are not big, and being a worker, home-based worker, is not one job in the town. I mean that there are many people working this way and they spread the news and that's how 40,000 members are gained mainly by this. But there, is, for example, uh, we have several shops 
for the production of home-based workers. And <coughs> they are trying to find a way to sell their productions. And, her, and when they heard that there is a shop like that, they uh, are willing to become a member of the association so that they can sell their productions in these shops. So this is another way of doing this, gaining uh, members. And there are many other ways, but I really can't name them because I knew only these two ways as a personal experience. Uh, yes, comrade. Sorry, comrade, your name. Uh, Don't away from Croatia. I, I, I don't have a question. I just want to add something to Jinsuk's answer to the, to the questions. Uh, um, uh, Jinsuk mentioned that the global migration uh, campaign. But I, I would also like to say something that I've already uh, talked about in discussion groups about uh, organizing on big infrastructure projects in Southeast Europe, in, in, in the Western Balkan regions. I think the DWI started, DWI started a good uh, uh, group of activities that uh, try to organize workers uh, on big infrastructure projects because the infrastructure sector, well, uh, workers are moving too fast. They are probably three weeks or two months in one place and then they are on another. And those projects are quite long, uh, six months, a year, or two years. And then, uh, well, uh, there was uh, several activities that uh, also BWI, uh, BWI leadership and staff uh, union representatives from Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, and Macedonia are visiting those infrastructure projects. We are uh, contacting uh, clients, for example, uh, for example, EBRD, then contacting uh, uh, not those, those are creditors, then contacting main clients, for example, Croatian uh, out, uh, outways, highways, then contacting uh, 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 main contractors and subcontractors, and try to collect, collect them all, all them in one place, in one construction site. Explain them what, what we, we want and try to uh, get to, to the workers. So, and th those results uh, could, could be uh, easily, uh, how to say, we can really, we can really uh, number the, the, uh, measure the number of new, of new uh, members. Uh, this action is still going on. So, we have still two or three years of, of big projects in Macedonia, Bosnia, and Serbia, and we think that this, this uh, activity really gets some good results. Very good. Okay, Connery right at the back there. Yeah. Let me ask this guy from South Africa. I, I just want to make a general point. Come at it in a more, more in an abstract fashion. I mean, in South Africa, the key thing is in many workplaces, contract workers are becoming the majority. And, and they're not in the union. And uh, in some instances, they're actually, you know, when they do campaign, they do collectivize, just, just as ordinary workers, they are getting better deals than the trade unions uh, because of what's happening uh, to our trade unions. And I'm talking about some of our best trade unions. Uh, often it's not the case. But I think the, the, the abstract point is if we look at the history, uh, the 30s, perhaps the best period to compare what we're seeing or what we've seen uh, with the Great Recession, is it was only at the end of the 1930s, uh, as they were coming out of the Great Depression, did we see big political strikes major strike action start taking off again around the world, particularly in the US. And in some ways, unless, because there's no easy answer to organizing contract workers outside of a changed political context, where you've got hundreds of thousands of workers who are politically know, have a sense of the system they're fighting and are confident that they can achieve something from that system, from their struggles, uh, that we are now laying the groundwork in many ways for those big fight backs that will come as we begin to move out of the, the recession and workers feel more confident. Thank you.
Thank you very much. By the way, we had is the director of the film uh, that we're showing tonight about Marikana, which is being shown at 8 o'clock, <coughs> oh, 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock, <coughs> and he will be able to speak a bit after the film as well. So welcome, welcome, by the way. Uh, Kali. My question is for uh, Jesse. Uh, what is the level of engagement of DWI with the Middle uh, East governments uh, regarding the construction uh, workers and especially regarding, uh, especially in Qatar, what is happening there? Uh, because there are a lot of Pakistani workers that are going to the Middle East and uh, uh, it's very really difficult to. Uh, So we actually have had three missions to Qatar, and in those three missions, we have met with Qatari officials. Uh, we're, we are approaching them to possibly meet in September, where we've outlined specifically 11 concrete demands that we want to approach to them in, in discussing around the situation of mining workers. And the 11 demands focus around no compliance system, as well as the repeal of the things that as well as the safety and health of work and the right for freedom association. But we also have the strategy of you say a long term and a short term engagement. So we uh, have uh, asked we the likelihood is that we will probably meet with them in September, um, depending upon um, and it, and that meeting it's a real negotiating meeting about our demands. So that's one strategy. But another strategy that we look at is the construction companies that are actually operating Qatar. So we have been discussing with at least uh, 20 construction companies to hopefully look at signing some sort of agreement that would look at the rights of migrant workers specifically in Qatar. Some of these companies, we have international framework agreements. So that agreement is a separate thing. The separate migrant workers agreement would be a separate initiative that we would add on to uh, the already discussions we've had with the framework agreement. And this discussion is also the, in partnership with the ILO. And the ILO has actually agreed. I know the criticisms about the ILO, but if you can use them, you can use them. <laughs> so we're using them. So they're using the, uh, the ILO to bring the big company. Uh, so it's a BWI and ILO initiative to talk to construction companies looking at industrial relations and specific rates of climate workers in Qatar. And of course, another strategy that we should have in PFAC. So in all of these strategies, is that we're looking at how do we have agreements to ensure that migrant workers can not only join trade unions, but their situation is improved. And so I know some of you are thinking, okay, all of this is in the global there. What are you doing on the ground, right? Because the ground is really important. Where is that woman there, the shop steward from the art workers? Oh, she's, Clark, she's, Clark. She's, she's still there, right? Or she's like, oh, there she is. So, who, who has, you know, emphasized the need to so for us, we actually have started organizing in Qatar. We've sent, um, and I guess you would use the American model of saying salt team, but what we have sent is project organizers from India and Nepal who have gone to Qatar, and we have a group of um, identified key points in the different communities, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, as well as India, and they, and Nepalese, and Filipino too, yes, yes. Uh, and so this is, uh, while at the same time we're doing the global strategies, we're also doing the groundwork. Because it doesn't matter whatever 
what you do at the global level if you don't have a work of it. And no matter how difficult it is in Qatar, we see that there is a possibility to form some kind of network or an association. And we're looking at a different model. I mean, in the end, because of the structure of Qatar, it might not be, it, may, it will not be a union unless they recognize the legal framework for migrant workers to join unions. But we're also looking at strategies that they form a network and association and that they will affiliate to DWI. So that's a different way we're looking in terms of Qatar. Okay, Leo. Yeah, two quick questions. Um, when it comes to organizing in the UK, stand up. <laughs> Leon Brewer, RMT. So when it comes to organizing here in the UK, agency workers um, and now zeroes hour contract workers have been used, um, and probably historically in some way, to cover industrial action. Um, and, and in some respects, um, I think there has been a bit of not bigotry, but there has been, I think, and I'm just going to say it, some sort of uh, us and them, with the, the, the people who aren't full time employed, and that's changing, luckily. Um, but anyway, as it stands now, I find that they're, in, that they're in such a precarious position that they can't afford to strike. Because if, if you've got no hours contracted, then if you take action, even if I tell you to do something and you don't want to do it, even if it's not part of your job, Tomorrow you haven't got a job, and that's that's the real reality I find um, people are trying to get to, into the union. So what tactics have, have we got? Creative tactics. I've heard of, of this thing from um, someone from this campaign, fifteen dollar campaign, where they got an action where everybody went into McDonald's and paid with pennies, um, and it just held up the queue and caused chaos. Um, so things like that. And I've been I've been reading Saul Alinsky's uh, Walls of Radical, which has got a few creative tactics in there. And also the second thing is we talked about unions now actually using their money, their subs, um, to, to you know organize precarious workers. That's that's a good that's that's a good example of basically people who are in a stronger position assisting the people who are in a more vulnerable position. Um, and I think that's something that has to be done uh, around the world um, if we're going to help precarious workers. Um, but I mean, there's the obvious argument, the arguments that I always use about um, class solidarity. But can you talk about the experience of inspiring people who um, who haven't got the vision to see how um, that their struggle is your struggle? So the arguments that that come uh, in that process. Okay, Ken, well, that sounds wrong to like for one for you. So, how do you overcome the divisions between precarious and sort of full-time? permanent employees, and what tactics have you developed? I, I have a related question. To okay. Yeah, go ahead, go on. The, the, uh, all these fast food chains are obviously transnational corporations, and they're worldwide. Uh, is there an international dimension to the struggle? Is there an involvement of other unions from other countries? Uh, is the IOF involved? Uh, uh, what is the international dimension of this program? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in respect to the uh, international dimension, mm -hmm. uh, yes, the IUF is involved. Uh, we had about 33 countries that were involved on May 15th. So on May 5th and 6th of this year, we had uh, about 30 countries come to uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of them brought fast food workers. So we had fast food workers essentially from around the world meeting with fast food workers from the U.S. Uh, which was really cool about it. They were like trading shirts and hats and bracelets and all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, they were also, uh, you know, they had shirts like mixed stripe from like Denmark and they were giving it to, you know, a young lady from New York who gave them her bracelet and, you know, stuff like that. But they were also, uh, you know, talking about their work situation. So you had, you know, a young lady from Denmark that they actually have the union. She worked for McDonald's. She makes the equivalent of like $21, $22 an hour. Uh, time and a half on sick days, you know, so on and so forth, which was very, very inspirational to the U.S. workers that were like, oh, so then their, their light bulb went off even more like, oh, this really is like they believed it was possible. But having a McDonald's worker in front of them saying we had a, a fight similar to this back in the 80s and now this is what we have, like definitely, you know, uh, <laughs> kind of recharge people for the fight. Um, and then on May 15th, we had a lot uh, around the world people uh, they protested, they danced. I actually had a video that uh, that I have on my phone that hopefully we can show sometime this week. But 
you know, it, it just shows actions from all around the world. People holding signs, people marching, people dancing. All, all of it was fast food workers. Uh, you know, a show of solidarity around the globe is really what ended up happening on May 15th. And the uh, international unions have been extremely helpful. And so we're trying to figure out how to move forward uh, after May 15th. Like, how do we expand? How do we make this bigger? And how do we make this an international fight? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. And then, Leon, I'm going to his first question. Uh, uh, Leon's questions were, first of all, how do you overcome the, the division between precarious and non-precarious workers and the, the tension between that? And what are the tactics that, some of the tactics that you've used? Yeah, I mean, it goes back, it goes back to education, kind of the piece that we were talking about earlier today. You know, you have to keep your members educated about not only, uh, you know, their situation, but the, the position that working class people are in in the country and around the globe. And, you know, when you talk to a lot of the members in our union and I'm sure other unions, like people understand that even though they have the union, that that they are in trouble. You know, uh, it, we just had a Harris, uh, Harris B versus uh, Quinn. But basically, uh, you know, we're about to lose probably close to 400,000 members or so uh, in SEIU because of a Supreme Court case that just came down last week. So, you know, even though people have the union in the U.S., a lot of them know like it, it's, it's very, very unstable and that the only way that they're going to get the ground that people had back in the 30s, you know, in the, in the 40s is going to be by uh, organizing workers who aren't doing as well as them. Like you can show member statistics that say that at one point, 35 percent of people in the private sector were in a union and now it's down to 6.6 percent. You know, if it keeps dropping 20 years from now, we'll be arguing about who's going to shut off the lights in the union hall. So, you know, and workers understand that. So, you know, and from the, from a self-interest perspective, it's like, well, because I want to keep my contract and I want things to get better in my workplace, it makes sense that, you know, we try to help other workers who aren't in a position. And then when you explain that fast food is the fastest growing industry in the country, you know, along, along with, uh, you know, the service sector, uh, low wage jobs, they're saying by 2020, like half the people in the U.S. will be making less than, you know, 12.50 an hour. So, you know, when, when you just look at the statistics, it's not hard to paint the picture and people understand that solidarity and kind of standing together as working class people, not just SEIU members or, you know, union members, but as working class people, like we're going to have to stick together, not only nationally, but around the globe in order to sustain real power. And then as far as tactics that, uh, that we've employed on the campaign, that's probably been one of the funnest things yet. So one of the things that we do, uh, one thing that I would say is generally speaking, we have not had workers that were terminated on this campaign for whatever reasons. I think that, you know, when we did the first strikes in New York City, we had one young lady from a Wendy's that they tried to fire. So when she walked back into work, they were like, oh, you were a no call, no show yesterday. You're fired. And we were, uh, so when people go on strike the next day, they're walked back into work by clergy, community leaders, community residents. So it might be five workers who went on strike. They're walked back in by like 25 people from the community essentially saying, look, where's your boss at? Bring your boss up here. Hey, buddy, these are our friends. And if you, you mess with them, you're going to have some problems on your hands. Anyway, <laughs> this, this young lady, she went in ahead of the delegation. So before she could clock in, they terminated her. So we were literally coming in right behind her, about 30 of us. She explained to the city council member that they had just terminated her. Uh, he started explaining that to people in the store. The customers started to leave. Everybody that was a part of the delegation started getting on their phones, calling their girlfriends, boyfriends, husbands, cousins, everybody saying, come up here to this store, come up here to this store. In 45 minutes, the crowd grew from about 30 to about 90 people. They called the police on us. Uh, the police made us go outside of the store. But I mean, you know, the, the sidewalk is public property. So, you know, at that point, it was probably 100 plus people in about an hour standing in front of the Wendy's. So it's like, you know, I had a taste for some Wendy's fries, but I don't think I want to walk through 100 people to get it. You know what I mean? So at this point, the store is effectively shut down. And so the GM came out and he found the young lady. And he told her, go ahead and put your uniform on. You're going back to work and I'm going to pay you for the hour. It was like the fastest hire and fire in American history. You know? so, so, so that's one, one tactic that we employ is just bringing, you know, just full-fledged, just uh, bringing the community, community leaders, residents, uh, city council members, and those people to the store and just showing the strength in numbers. Uh, you know, when we do do things like, uh, 
sometimes this happens to be a lot of us and we happen to have a lot of change and we all stand in line and order something from the store, which creates a really long line. And, you know, if your meal is five dollars and you're counting it out in pennies, it's going to take you a while to count out those pennies. And then once again, effectively, what ends up happening is the store becomes effectively shut down at that point. And the profit uh, in, in, the U, in the United States, a lot of these stores are franchised. Uh, but, you know, I will also say that it, they're still run by the actual corporation at the top. But uh, their profit margin is so small. So, you know, when you, you know, when you have 100 people inside of a store, in front of a store for a couple of hours, you do that for five to seven days, you're about to cripple the store at that point. So now the employer has to make somebody uh, that was up here earlier was, was saying, well, I think it was the video. And it said, uh, we have to make it more, uh, more expensive for you not to do it. So it's like, okay, fine. Uh, now you have to make a decision. We can keep shutting down your store for lunchtime for the next 14 days, or you can give Tasha her job back at $8 an hour and 10 hours a week, which one makes more sense. And the employer <coughs> tends to believe that it makes more sense to just hire Tasha back. So just community pressure, you know, uh, the, the change, which is, you know, kind of the same thing. It's just effectively shutting the store down. And then politicians and other unions just have been very, very helpful. Uh, we've also had uh, union members who are like trained stewards and people who have been educated and gone through fights in their, with their own employers who come and talk to the fast food workers and uh, explain to them how they deal with their employers. So, uh, you know, I think that when you have a group, because these workers are still pretty new to the labor movement, so it's not, you know, we're still trying to educate them step by step. So we bring union members to educate them, you know, but they don't just educate the workers, they educate other low-wage workers. So these fast food workers are tied to car wash workers in a lot of other cities. They're tied to Walmart workers in a lot of the cities. It's almost like a low-wage movement, so to speak, that, that's happening in a lot of these cities. And uh, I think tactically that's helpful, too, because when things happen at the car washes, then, you know, you have fast food workers show up, grocery store workers show up, Tony and Johnny and Katie that just happens to live down the street. And it's like this this weird feel of like low wage workers and people who live on their block along with, you know, high profile names of clergy and city council members that show up. And all of that tactically creates more pressure for the employer who has to make a decision. Uh, you know, in New York, we've had the attorney general step in a couple of times uh, to do things. So. Uh, once again, I think it's just because of the actual heat that's on the ground that politicians are trying to figure out how can we, you know, which way is the wind blowing? Oh, it's blowing with the workers. How can we get in there and help these workers on this fight? So uh, tactically, I think that that's been, that's been helpful, kind of just, once again, having those coalitions on the ground. Great. I'll come right in the fireplace then. Yeah, I'm trying to be easy to follow up on that one. <laughs> I have uh, two quite different questions because I have originally one for Joanna and then I've got one for that after. So the, the most important one goes to you, uh, Joanna, and then I'll take a little bit about Katarina while you think about it. Uh, the first one is what I want me to know is what kind of um, homework does you organize? And the second one is I imagine that normally if you go to a factory or a shop or something, uh, the main argument for organizing workers would be that you have a shop steward and you have a collectivity. So what, what have you found to, to play as an argument to get home workers to organize in your union? Uh, and, and I can take the Qatar thing and you can answer that one first. Uh, the second is on, on, on Qatar because Qatar is, is an absolute disgrace, most of us would agree in here. It is the 21st century slave capital of the world, there's no doubt about it. 4,000 workers estimated to be dead within kickoff World Cup 2022. And what, what the question that me and that Martin have raised on behalf of the youth and Trinity for our Congress now is: At what point do we go to our governments and demand that we should not uh, say no to investments in Qatar? When do we say to international companies that it, it is unacceptable to be in Qatar instead of having dialogue? Because I I I have lost belief in dialogue with the Qatar government. <laughs> directed to me was if we're engaging in discussions with the Qatari government. And yes, we are trying to. But that doesn't stop us from saying to our uh, governments or companies, stop investing now. Stop uh, dialogue now. I mean, I think that the strategy that we have 
in looking at Qatar and linking to the World Cup is a multifaceted strategy. There's different parts of it. Use whatever that works. So go now. <laughs> Knock on the door and say, stop this. OK. And um, uh, Joanna. Yeah. Well, about the kind of workers, farm uh, based workers are doing different jobs. So uh, we have members from almost every kind of job. Uh, we have uh, architects, we have uh, artists, uh, interpreters, wood cavers. My mom is one and she's a member. We have um, people working in the textile uh, sector. We have uh, people working in the food sector and so on. So we have really different kinds of jobs. And about the arguments, uh, having in mind the low in Bulgaria, they uh, unregistered worker can sell the uh, pro his or her production. And being a member of the association gives them the opportunity to sell and to sell it. So this is the main argument we have so that we can uh, gain members. And this is for the agri agriculture form uh, producers, for diary producers, for artists, and so on. So we uh, help them to <coughs> do it legally. OK. I think we've got time for one or two last questions. I'm seeing Kirill at the back and our comrade, uh, who hasn't spoken. Anybody else? Put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Kirill. OK, Kirill and then you, sorry, and then we squeeze one in. Let's take all three. Kirill. I have a question um, concerning the migrant workers with construction. And this Luke mentioned um, the experience of Sochi and Olympic Games. And uh, actually, I was observing what was happening during the operation. There were lots of reports about use of migrant workforce from Serbia in the construction objects in, in Russia, and there were lots of reports of uh, abuse of, of the workers' rights and people who were not paid, sent back, uh, who were not actually able to follow it up properly with uh, human rights organizations in Russia, but maybe taking this opportunity, uh, you are present here, and you were observing it from the headquarters of BWI, and you can tell us a bit about the experience of Serbian workers in, in Russia. And uh, if you are able to do anything to change this, I, I mean, I think the best person to answer that question is Sasha, because he was instrumental actually in getting 90 Serbian migrant workers outside of Sochi, uh, who was basically stuck without their passports, and etc. So Sasha, I think yeah. you should answer that. Yes, uh, I my colleague and uh, the people who go to, uh, from my trade union organize the people, workers who, who go to, to Russia, to Sochi, to uh, work on the Olympic, uh, Olympic construction. And uh, we start uh, to, to take about, uh, take care about these workers, I think, in uh, 2012 year. Uh, and, uh, this is uh, after this uh, this activity uh, we, we we make uh, after the problem with the political uh, uh, with political situation in Russia political situation uh, I, I I try to remember uh, the all of uh, of activities uh, now about uh, the one uh, one. Um, Situation uh, when the uh, president Putin, this is the, this time was be president, uh, go to the Sochi and uh, 
don't uh, don't uh, be uh, don't be не uh, задоволен интерсивным разговором. Не удовлетворен с скоростью, с скоростью, с скоростью, с скоростью, с скоростью, с скоростью, с And after that, the corruption uh, pyramid uh, is is broken. Uh, uh, this is the, the I think uh, the main uh, the main uh, the, the point of uh, the when the the troubles uh, for the workers in Serbia uh, uh, be largest. Understand me. After that, uh, the the wages uh, 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 the, the wages. Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, after that, the wages are uh, aware, aware, and uh, too much people from the Serbia lost your wages. Uh, don't have arranged uh, agreements. These people come to Sochi without. Agreements without visas, uh, only like tourist, tourist uh, visa, and uh, um, in the, in the uh, on, on the Russian slow, you you stay for the like tourist in Russia only three months. If the spend three three months in Russia, these uh, workers go to the nearest uh, border. Only make the sign <laughs> with the border officers and come again on the construction. How we organize? Uh, this is the main, the main question. We organize uh, the these workers uh, after uh, after uh, to make the uh, uh, deal with the NGO Astra. The NGO Astra bringing about anti trafficking, but. Uh, Uh, we have the elements of uh, trafficking in the constructions on, uh, on such. And Astra are bringing about uh, 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 women and children children's who is the, the victim of trafficking. We want to bring about workers and we have a deal. Not agreement, only a deal. Without paying, without no, uh, everything. And after that we, uh, we contact uh, the workers who knows uh, Uh, to, to, to use the Facebook, to use the uh, internet, and after that we connect and uh, we, we, we receive the list of the workers with names and the numbers uh, of uh, documents, uh, passports, and uh, with these uh, documents uh, we, 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 we make the pressure for the, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs And uh, with BWI, with uh, Yinsuk, with uh, Ahmed Yusson, yes, we <laughs> make the one letter, <laughs> strong letter <laughs> for our government. And after that, we have uh, a three group uh, with uh, 50, uh, 47 to 55, uh, 51 or two uh, workers who come with bus, and the last. Uh, Group come with airplane. This is the workers from the Bosnia, uh, Albania, and Serbia. And uh, the, this group have uh, 150 workers. And after that, the ambassador of uh, Republic of Serbia in the Russia go to television and says, "We arrange everything. <laughs> We make the good uh, good situation for our workers and for our people." And, I says okay. <laughs> the work is at home. Cool. This is all. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, last two. Well, no, your last two questions. <laughs> uh, uh, yourself, comrade, and then Alex. Sorry, I mean, we are running out of time. So I went from the GMB. Um, following on from what uh, Leon was saying with regards to uh, curious and non-curious workers in the UK, um, what I find in the workplace is I have uh, a lot of workers. Um, that basically employer will play off the two against each other and what that creates is obviously we have a lot of zero hour contract people 
So they will be the substitute labour if I take out my full-time staff on strike. So I was just wondering, in the fast food campaign specifically, if at any point in, when the campaign was you know, quite small and was, was in its early stages, if there was ever that, that threat of substitute labour and how that was dealt with, um, because that's a big problem to overcome uh, in zero-hour contracts. And the second question leading on from that was, obviously, a lot of our campaigning that we do is, especially through social media, is structured at younger people as well as older people. But we do, we have two kind of very separate campaigns because of younger people generally engage more with social media. So I was just wondering if there was a differentiation between the two in terms of what style of campaign you use, and also in terms of um, if you're using, I know it's not uh, in the union yet, but if the plans are to have a, a different structure for the youth as well as older people, because getting young people and young people involved <coughs> for me is something I'm particularly interested in, in bringing up more people at the same kind of similar age to myself, um, because I think you need new people to trigger off the young member stuff every now and then. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Alex. Two questions. Thanks, Elliot. And Alex, let's get you on. Yeah. Uh, so, Alex Wood, and I'm a member of uh, UCU. <laughs> I just, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I was wondering whether you think kind of the tra traditional kind of conception of trade unions kind of based around collective bargaining, whether that is actually the correct kind of aim and goal for organizing informal and precarious workers due to the, the high level of term turnover, the multiple employers or whether kind of alternative forms of worker associations is something which should be kind of which should be more productive and so I think with with Walmart workers like they see our Walmart much more of being kind of not an aim towards unionization because it's not not going to be possible and rather putting direct pressure on, on the employer and so whether we should be looking at alternatives other than just just unions. Okay if I could uh, ask Kendall to respond to the questions from Elliot, because I think they were really directed to you, and then maybe all three respond to that final question about actually is it unions or do we need to find alternative forms of organisation um, and to, and also wrap up each one. So let's start with you, Kendall. Yeah, uh, we've been doing one day strikes, so it hasn't been a huge threat, uh, you, know, uh, you know, them actually getting their jobs permanently replaced. What they have done is stores that we've shut down, meaning we took like all the workers from that store out then uh, a lot of times that franchise owner or the corporation will bring workers from other stores to come and take their place. But because, you know, our goal is not to shut down stores. So it doesn't really, I mean, that's like a bonus if we, you know, shut down a store and like take out all the workers. But we still have the same effect whether the store runs or not. Uh, but I will say that, you know, we've had more than five instances where workers that they brought over to replace these workers, we took them, we got them to go on strike too. So uh, that's always cool uh, because once it, we'll just go up inside the store and, you know, we'll have three workers go inside the store, explain what's happening, and then, you know, we've had some success in, in getting people out, which is, uh, you know, huge for the workers. Like, they love that. And then um, in relation to the, to the, to the young and kind of old workers through, through social media, We've had, uh, we've, we've gotten both. Uh, I mean, depending on where you cut off the old, you know, line at, uh, which I'm, I'm not going to do. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we've had uh, people older than 25 uh, or 30 reach out to us through Facebook and uh, some of the social social media sites. <laughs> through, uh, through Facebook and Twitter and some of the social media sites. Uh, I guess they are younger people that tend to, to, to reach out through social media. But a lot of times, um, you know, there are people that can help us get inroads into their store. The other interesting thing about these workers is sometimes they work in two or three different stores. So you meet one worker and you just got inroads in, a, you know, two or three different stores where you can meet, you know, the, the workforce in general and get a better sense of the issues that are going on there. Uh, and I, I feel like it was a third part to that question. Did I answer? No, that's all right. Okay. That's good. Cool. All right. It's just, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we've been trying to get hold of um, uh, uh, Myrtle Vitboy on, but there's been technical problems at her end, I think. Um, so we're unable to bring her up on the screen, which is a great shame. Uh, but hopefully, anyway, you should go and look at your websites about what they do in the International Domestic Workers Federation, because it's extremely interesting. So the final question was, which I think is a very good one to end up on, 
for each one of you. When we're thinking about informal and precarious workers, are we really talking about finding an entirely alternative form of organization for those workers? Let's start with Jim Sook and come this way. Um, before actually I answer that, I want to, um, I, I'm glad that Don Boy talked about the organizing that we're doing around infrastructure. I might focus my presentation on microphone because that's what I was asked to do. Yeah. But uh, the nature of our construction, as you know, is very precarious and it's very informal. So there's action, uh, there's various, I think, campaigns that we've done that has been very successful in terms of organizing uh, the construction workers, in whether they're subcontract or outsourced. I mean, one of the clear examples is in South Korea, where you have basically started with nothing. Um, within 15 years, they've been able to organize over 50,000 construction workers. And they have a lot of uh, strength, even within the small percentage they have within the industry, but they have actually uh, physical strength in terms of being able to negotiate with the, the employers' associations. And, and I think this is critical for me to point out because that within uh, construction, what we see is that in Europe, there's also an increasing shift from what it was formal, it's becoming informal, and it's becoming precarious. So what was in the past where a lot of the European unions sort of supported the South in terms of organizing strategies of how to organize precarious workers was coming back home. So a lot of the European unions are now looking at the South of how the South unions have been able to successfully organize precarious workers, outsourced workers, and subcontract workers because they are faced with that. And it's actually even migrant workers too, because there are, uh, you know, even in the UK, you have problems with a large, with a large number of the, the posted workers and social dumping. So the construction unions here in the UK are are, are sort of at the complexity of how do we address. This? And so, and I'm, I'm, I bring back to, I think there was a woman who said the first day that there is no longer a North and South anymore. It's sort of, some sort of, in many sense, we're becoming equal. Uh, uh, so, so I think the, the important part is to look at how we can share the strategies of what was traditionally thought of as a Southern strategy of organizing informal, precarious and wider, and a Northern strategy of organizing formal and permanent. It doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's actually something that we can equal look at. So there's a way to shift there. Now the hard question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think this is uh, it's, it's, it's a question that requires actually a lot of different uh, long-term discussion, and people may disagree. But in the end, I'm a trade unionist. And although I believe that we should build a global labor movement, as a trade unionist, I believe that um, we have to work to organize workers into trade unions. And, and, the, and the ultimate goal for us in terms of change is to do collective bargaining. So as part of that strategy, of course, we, we build partnerships, we build alliances, we have to look at how we uh, develop different organizing strategies. And it, and it can be a trade union uh, Workers, uh, worker center alliance. It could be uh, uh, the way we're looking at Qatar, because the framework doesn't allow for them to have trade unions exist. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna stop this. Okay, then we can form an association, a committee in Qatar. So let's end here. We will continue until Qatar uh, government allows workers, to, migrant workers, to join the trade unions that they have the legal claim to work. To join trade unions. So for me, yes, I believe that we should have different alternative strategies, and we should look at different forms of organizing associations and communities. But as a trade unionist, I have to believe, and I have to strongly believe that yes, we should form trade unions. Joanna, do you think we need alternative forms of organization for home-based workers or, or within unions? Well, uh, if we have in mind and consider that uh, we first have an organization, uh, uh, association, and then in the last few months we organized a syndicate, I, I can give my personal opinion that We've tried the alternative, firstly, and then the traditional way of trade union. 
And that's my personal opinion. And I must confess that I'm not sure what's the opinion of the association. So I'm giving just my personal. Very good. Okay. Can do. Uh, are these, after this campaign has uh, come to <coughs> conclusion, will people be in unions or will they be in other forms of organization? I mean, I mean, this is my personal opinion. Also, I mean, I just think, uh, I just think that we're at a point in the labor movement now where we have to start questioning everything. I think we need to question uh, our tactics. I think we need to question the way that we organize workers. I think we need to ask why do we do things like this? Why do we do things like that? You know, I think that generally speaking, speaking, workers need power within their workplace. Workers need contracts. Uh, you know, there's certain things that they need to negotiate over. Um, do you know all the contracts need to be a hundred pages? Do you always have to negotiate over all? I mean, I think that there's some other questions that can be put on the table, uh, including you know, uh, an organization versus a labor union. But I think we have to question what the definition of organization is and what the definition of a labor. I mean, I just think we're at a point where we have to question things, and that the old way is not working because that we we know the situation that we're in, and that we have to figure out something new if we want to see something new. And I just know that when the fast food campaign was created, it was totally different. It, like at the time, it was like left field. And, and every, including myself, was like, I don't know, this sounds a little, you know, I was, I was a tad bit skeptical. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but different is good. You know, don't be afraid of different. And, and it's like, at the end of the day, you have to try something different. So I, 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 so I don't have an answer to yes or no. I would just say that I think we're at a point where we have to question everything and we have to stop doing things just because that's the way that we've been doing it and then saying, oh, if this didn't work, that doesn't mean come with something new. That means go back to what they did 80 years ago. It's like, I just don't, I just don't believe that. I just think we have to uh, really you know, get some new minds in there. We have to all put our heads together, old and new, and figure out what makes the most sense because the world is changing rapidly. OK, I just want to publicize this. Uh, this is a little booklet called Challenges and Experiences in Organizing Home-Based Workers in Bulgaria, uh, which gives a lot more detail uh, on the association and how it organizes. And many of the questions you are asking, actually, there's a lot of detail in here. And we've got enough copies for everybody if you're interested. Uh, and I wrote it. So, <laughs> <laughs> secondly, uh, I, we have, uh, I think, some copies, not enough for quite everybody, but quite a few. If people are interested about how home based workers are organizing more, more generally, uh, we've got some copies of a pamphlet called We Are Workers Too. Organizing Home-Based Workers in the Global Economy, uh, which was written by Celia. Which, where are you, Celia? Stand up, Celia. Sir, Celia may the old comrade. Um, <laughs> so you can get signed copies of uh, that book. <laughs> I've got copies of both of these things in the front. OK. Uh, and just to remind you that at 7 o'clock, one hour